Um, recording is in progress. Okay, so um, hello everybody. Welcome to the session, Hack Your Reading Room, integrating special collections, request and circulation workflows into the Alma Library Services platform. A nice um, short title to describe our project today that we're going to talk about. Um, so a little bit of background first, I would like we were going to we're going to introduce ourselves very briefly and then i'm going to dive into the background so we're talking about um, a project and the three of us here presenting today were the main project team that worked on this project and so i'm leah richardson i'm the public services librarian for uh, special collections at george washington university and i'm joined here today by my colleague dulce smith who will introduce himself Hi there, this is Dulce Smith. Um, I'm a software developer and a librarian at the George Washington University and also um, have sort of primary responsibilities for configuring and troubleshooting all. And Jen King. Hi, I'm Jen King. I'm the collections coordinator and manuscripts librarian uh, in special collections and I do mostly technical services and collection development. You colleagues. Um, so we are here today to talk about a project that we worked on together to configure Alma to support the request and circulation functions of our special collections research center in the library. Maybe a show of hands, how many special collections folks are here today? Not that I can see anybody's hands. Um, I see Bridget. Um, so this will apply and be of interest um, to our special collections colleagues across the WRLC. And I want to state up front that um, you should absolutely contact all of us. We're going to give our emails at the end of the session if you have any questions about implementing this at your institutions. Um, so this is a project that we did to solve, almost solved a lot of our problems. And we're going to get deeply into those problems in just a moment. Um, but just a little bit about special collections here at GW. We have nine full-time staff and a rotating group of student workers ranging from four to six at any given time. We're very busy. We serve lots of internal and external researchers, both on site and remote, and we have a robust um, instruction program. 95% of our collection, both our book and our archival collections, are housed off-site at the WRLC Shared Collection Facility. Um, so it gets pretty messy when we have to request things. There's lots of requests, lots of going back and forth. Um, things are always um, in flux with requests and the status of things. And um, so Alma helped fix a lot of that um, inconsistency and messiness. And also in terms of what we use here um, in for our software, we use um, Archive Space as our uh, descriptive management software and book records, all of our bound items and archival collection level records are discoverable in um, Primo and Alma. They're all in Alma and in Primo. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the next slide and Jen's gonna talk. Um, so I'm just going to give a little bit more background and talk about the problems that we were solving or that we were looking to solve. I'm going to talk about two different areas, communication and um, inventory control. Um, but, you know, as a background, and I think it's sort of obvious, uh, we had a very messy, complicated and very inefficient process for managing both the researcher side of things uh, and then also any kind of st stats that we were gathering for statistics uh, for circulation. Um, as Leah said, we have a very robust, busy reading room. Um, and I would say that, that what we had in place was what worked for a while, and, but it didn't scale. Um, so in terms of communication, our primary mode of communication was email. Many, many, many emails. Um, so everyone knows, or I think probably everyone on this knows that when you make a request, barcodes are your key. That's what you're looking for. Um, and as Leah said, uh, we had uh, we use a space as our collection management system, and we have we, have, we use Alma as well. We have barcodes in both places, but not consistently. So um, in order to email WRLC and ask them for to bring to send over the materials that were off site, we need to capture those barcodes, and we would end up going to both systems, um, hunting things down. Um, we would send because we're so busy. We would be sending. WRLC emails 
near on a near constant basis, uh, everyone on staff can send emails to them, and and we were doing that. So they were getting sort of a barrage. And at one point, we tried to rein that in, have everyone coordinate uh, and send maybe one or two emails a day. But that was just another layer of sort of manual work that we had to do for our requesting. Um, we also emailed patrons uh, and would let them know when their materials had arrived um, on site. We were not probably consistent in that messaging. We had we did try to have like boilerplate language so that we would all be you know indicating to the patrons the same procedures. Uh, but we're pretty sure that that wasn't always um, wasn't always followed. Um, the other thing with the emails that I think is important to note is that when we made a request to WRLC, any back and forth about that um, about that request was that the sort of the item history was trapped in that email. And so only the people that were on that email thread could know the history of that transaction. And so I think those were were big limitations. Next slide, please. Uh, and as I mentioned, our inventory control um, was inefficient as well. We for sort of tracking our the transit life cycle, we used a, a Google sheet um, that we called the hold log. Uh, and we would capture, you know, as much information as we could, who the patron was, there are those barcodes again. So here's just another place we had to find barcodes and add them to. We would have, um, you know, every time as this didn't scale, basically, we would keep adding columns, you know, a note column. Uh, you know, where is it column? I mean, we just kept sort of trying to add columns to this spreadsheet to, to, to get it to work. Um, we did try to automate it at times. We did uh, have a Google form that you would indicate what had been ordered and that would populate the whole log. Um, but that was just another place where we had to go in and make it, you know, get information about what we were, what we were doing. So, you know, we were nibbling at the edges of automation, but it, it just wasn't gonna work. Um, the other problem was that in a busy reading room with a lot of activity, uh, we had to rely on everyone to remember to update the whole log, um, and that would not always happen. Uh, and then we would the sort of the, the inventory uh, transit information would be out of sync. You know, we might this whole log, which was supposed to be sort of where the thing was, we might not it might not tell us exactly where it was. Um, the other thing is for statistics. You know, we would use this, uh, the whole log and our uh, registration cards to gather, um, you know, data about the use of our materials, which really resulted in a lot of, a lot of anecdotal data, more than like hard, hard data. Uh, we're a very uh, data-driven organization, um, and we use statistics to support requests for additional resources or for prioritization. Um, and so, you know, knowing, having rich, robust statistics is only going to benefit us. Great. And as Jen said, we had a lot of problems and we knew we needed, we all agreed that we needed something better because this system was not working. Um, so this started as a number of conversations. We engaged with um, the project manager at the time who worked here um, in the libraries and he really helped us. Shout out to Pete. Brazdovich, who's no longer at GW, but um, he really helped us facilitate conversation to identify the pain points very clearly and to envision the best possible system. If we could have the thing do exactly what we want it to do, what would that look like? Um, so this word cloud are all the notes from our meetings. So you can see these, these were the things we were to email, very prominent. Lots of, lots of email was one of the biggest pain points, I think, of the system. Um, and so from these conversations, we came up with some ideas. We were thinking maybe we could purchase Aon software, which is the Atlas Systems um, software workflow management um, platform that allow it that's designed specifically for special collection circulation, but that's way too expensive. So we couldn't do that. We thought about designing an access database. Um, and as Jen mentioned, we started using Google Forms. We thought if we had made a form for everything that that might help get us better and consistency with the data entry. Um, but really none of these were either affordable or met our needs. And so we looked to Alma as our next option. And so Dulce is gonna take over from here and talk about the back end of Alma and this project. Thanks, Leah. Um, and my apologies uh, 
I seem to be cursed whenever I'm giving a presentation, they start drilling in the vicinity. So you might hear that in the background. I hope it won't be too distracting. Um, so this was really a, a pleasure to work on this project with the special collections team. Um, I've done a lot of uh, thinking about workflows and experimenting with workflow optimization in Alma, as I know a lot of folks in attendance have also. Um, and, um, you know, like many of you who have worked with Alma or work with Alma in your sort of day to day functional responsibilities, um, I'm sure you're you might be familiar with a certain level of um, sort of jadedness that can set in about the system. Uh, it was really refreshing to work with special collections because they had not used Alma very much um, and, and were doing a lot of uh, the inventory control outside of it um, for reasons relating to sort of their uh, historical, um, what they had done in the past uh, in the Voyager environment. Um, and so they came to it kind of fresh. Um, and so they, they had a, an outlook on things that was a bit more optimistic um, than uh, is sometimes the case when trying to refactor workflows in Alma. So um, that was actually a real uh, breath of fresh air. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about kind of how we approach this and then talk about some of the um, technical aspects of the infrastructure. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try not to, in the interest of time, get too bogged down in details of Alma configuration with, with the acknowledgement that it can be pretty complex. So I invite anybody who is interested in how we did this um, or you know, it's interested in how you might um, adapt this to a need at your own institution to please get in touch with us. And we're happy to share all our documentation and um, screenshots from Alma, whatever would be helpful. Um, I think the most important thing in terms of our the project plan that we articulated um, was that we we had to come to a consensus around uh, what the priorities were because we couldn't achieve everything that we might have wanted to. Um, and I think in general, I mean, that's not just a rule that applies to Alma, but I think one challenge with Alma and workflows is that they tend to be very complicated and there tend to be a lot of, um, you know, perhaps, uh, unintended consequences and a lot of potential rabbit holes where you can kind of, you know, get lost in wondering why it does something this way and not this way. And so we, we kind of had to be very intentional about bracketing the things that we couldn't solve in an ideal way upfront and focus on the things where we could realize some benefit uh, relative to the existing workflow. Um, and it really helps that um, Jen and Leah and their colleagues in Special Collections had really good documentation of the existing workflow and well, also, as Leah mentioned, had gone through a process um, of identifying what the pain points were um, so that we could focus on those. Um, we also, uh, this also ended up being a very collaborative project beyond um, our, our group. Uh, so we drew heavily on expertise from um, the resource sharing staff uh, at GW, um, Glenn Canner and his team, um, in order to make sure that what we were doing would integrate as seamlessly as possible with what they were already doing in terms of retrieving materials from the SCF. Um, and of course, uh, the, the team at the shared collection facility, um, Aaron and Tammy and, and Tammy's team were uh, absolutely indispensable. Um, we also had to, um, had frequent conversation with uh, Kathy Kilda from Todd Gorley about the architecture um, of the SEF. Uh, we implemented this after the, the so-called re-architecture. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that just to make sure we're on the same page about what that in means for this kind of work. Um, but uh, Don and Kathy were really instrumental in making sure that um, the application that Ex Libris had uh, designed for the WRLC to facilitate retrieval from the shared collection facility to make sure that that application uh, would be would work for um, this more specialized use case. Um, and so once we once we kind of figured out all the moving pieces, um, then we did some testing in the sandbox. Um, and it was really important to to eval to sort of have an iterative cycle here of evaluating the impact on discoverability in Primo whenever we made a configuration change in Alma because these 
the connection there is really not very transparent. Um, there's a lot, lot of different pieces to the configuration, um, and I'll give kind of an overview in a second. Um, and but it's not always clear when you're in Alma configuring things what that's going to look like in Primo. So we kind of had to. It was really helpful to have the test environment to to tweak um, tweak things, uh, and then documentation. Um, you know, often maybe the neglected part of a project, not the not not the fun part. You get through the implementation and you're caught up in the elation of having it actually work. Um, and this is sort of a general rule, uh, general phenomenon I've encountered. Uh, documentation is sort of the um, the anticlimactic part, but with with all the workflows in particular, I think it is super important. And I really commend um, Leah and Jen uh, for all the documentation they produced um, because it's not only helpful for training staff, but a record of what we actually did um, which again, in Alma, it's easy to kind of lose sight of because the configuration is so complicated. If you step away for a minute and go back and then you're like, why did I, why did I make this decision? <laughs> it's, it's really nice to have that um, cohesively documented. Um, and I think Leah will talk a little bit later about how one of the benefits of this uh, work was much better ability to use Alma analytics um, to generate data about special collections usage. So um, this, this will be a review for some people, I'm sure. Um, and it's a pretty high level overview. So I'm not gonna, uh, gonna sort of sacrifice some detail here for the sake of uh, the overall story we're telling. Um, but if, if folks have not interacted with this part of Alma fulfillment, um, this is important to understand kind of the context in which our particular implementation of the reading room um, functionality uh, was it the particular context to which it was adapted? So there's, we have an unusual setup um, in the WLC in terms of um, how our various Alma IZs work with these shared collection facility. So the shared collection facility is its own institution zone. So its own catalog, if you will. Um, and we, each of us, each institution that has material at the shared collection facility, um, those records appear both in our home institution zone and in the shared collection facility. So, and this is this is the result of the re-architecture that Ex Libris and WLC um, engaged in in 2020, I think 2019, 2020. Um, and I should also mention that uh, Jen was actually part of those conversations from the beginning. So the architecture was designed with input from um, at least GW special collections kind of in anticipation that we might need to support this down the line. Um, but again, to return to this kind of high level overview, the important thing to remember is that there is sort of a shadow record for every record in the home in institution. There's a shadow record of that, of that in the SEF institution zone if the material is at the shared collection facility or belongs to the shared collection facility. So they're really two separate records that are connected by this special application that Ex Libris developed for us. Um, and the this is this slide shows the requesting workflow. So either a patron requests an item in Primo or staff can request the item in Alma. Um, but this this part happens, the part in white happens at the owning institutions IZ. So that would be George Washington University our Alma institution zone, the request is created, and then the Ex Libris application duplicates that request in the shared collection facility IZ, where the item, which triggers um, staff there to retrieve, prompt staff there to retrieve the item and send it to the requesting institution. Um, when the item arrives and is scanned in by staff at GW, that updates the item status in our IZ. So there's sort of two parallel um, flows happening uh, with two parallel item records. And it is important that those be synced up. Um, and the application generally does a pretty good job of that, but um, in, in configuring and troubleshooting, that was something we had to pay particular attention to. Okay, we can go to the next slide, which just shows the return trip. Um, so the item is put in transit to the shared collection facility at the owning institution. Um, 
And then when it's received at the SCF, the scanning of that barcode triggers the update on the status in the owning institution to show that it's in place. Um, so single item, two item records, um, and the this application makes sure that an update in one system, one institution zone is reflected in the other institution zone. Now, I, I, this is more complicated with resource sharing between libraries, but for special collections, one thing that does make it simpler is that uh, we're currently not using the resource sharing functionality. So we are not sending material, GW special collections material to other libraries in the consortium. So patrons from GW can request the material to be sent to the special collections at GW for their use. Patrons from elsewhere in the consortium or from outside because special collections is open to the public can with staff mediation request material um, and it's sent to special collections at UW for their use. So um, there's no, none of the resource sharing functionality is in play, um, except to the extent that there is this transfer from the SCF. Um, so in terms of the implementation of the reading room, um, this, this is sort of uh, a high, another high level view of ALMA fulfillment configuration. Um, and if you haven't done fulfillment configuration, um, it can be bewildering when you uh, sort of embark on it. Um, so again, I'm not gonna uh, trudge through the details, but I invite you to get in touch with us um, if you have questions um, about how this might work. But basically reading room configuration is a subset of Alma fulfillment configuration. So it's sort of a specialized version of the fulfillment configuration that would be in place for a regular circulating desk. Um, and so the, the general structure here is that an ALMA location, so like a, a physical location, a location for physical item belongs to a fulfillment unit. And a fulfillment unit has multiple locations. So what, the first thing we had to do was associate all of our special collections, physical locations, with a particular fulfillment unit. Um, and this includes physical locations for items that are on site and physical locations for items that are in the SCF. Um, and each fulfillment unit has one or more fulfillment unit rules. And these govern what behavior is allowed for particular locations or particular groups of staff uh, or groups of users rather. Um, so for instance, we have one rule for special collections locations that, you know, for GW faculty, students, and staff. Um, and then we have a separate rule for uh, non-GW patrons and special collections locations. Each rule is associated with a term of, a set of terms of use or a TOU as it's called in all the jargon. And the TOU determines what can be done with items in those locations by those users. Um, and there's terms of use for loan and terms of use for um, uh, for requests. Sorry. Um, Should I show the next slide? Don't say sorry because sure. it gives the specifics. Yeah. Go ahead. About this. Okay. Thanks. So um, for the reading room, again, this it's sort of a specialized subset of uh, the kinds of request and loan behaviors that are used at a regular circulation desk. Um, so the process of configuring is basically, we associated our special collection locations with a fulfillment unit. We created the rules to target those locations and the different user groups that would have different kinds of permissions. Then we created terms of use to go with those fulfillment unit rules. Um, and, uh, this all depends on there being a circulation desk associated with special collections. So um, just to clarify some confusing terminology, special collections is not a separate library in our institution zone. It is part of, you know, you can have separate libraries in your institution zone, um, but special collections is just part of Gelman library um, in our institution zone. We didn't define it as a separate library. That, that is a route that we probably could have taken, but it seemed a little overly complicated. However, it does have its own circulation desk, which is associated with all the physical locations that belong to special collections. 
Um, and then those physical locations are part of this fulfillment unit and they have these rules applied. And the special rules that kind of really allow the reading room behavior um, for requesting and, lo oh, sorry, for loaning is this in reading room only um, parameter. And then for requesting, it's this must pick up in owning library's reading room. And I think those are like part of the Alma defaults you can set. Um, but basically this means that the material um, can be checked out to someone only from the reading room circulation desk. So if they were happen to show up with it at the general circulation desk, it wouldn't, I, it, it shouldn't work to check it out though we didn't actually test that, but um, it's unlikely that would happen, but that that's uh, I think what that parameter prevents. And then um, is requestable, must pick up an owning library's reading room, that prevents someone from selecting some other locations and under the another library or something to pick the material up like there it sort of funnels those requests um to be picked up only in the um at the circulation desk associated with that reading room um we also uh had to kind of fiddle with the due dates and the hold shelf period um basically in a reading room set, set up when it's checked out to the patron, it can be checked back in without completing this sort of the, the request. So you have an option when you check back the check the material back in, you can say, okay, this is this is the final check in. So the request is complete, or it's not final, as in the patron expects to use it again. And that's important because the material in the reading room doesn't leave with the patron, right? It, someone might come to use a box one day, and they're going to come back the next day to use it, but the box will stay there um, while you know overnight. They're not going to take it with them. So it's a, so it's different in that sense from a regular circulation. Um, but in order to support that kind of extended, um, potentially extended use, uh, we had to set these extra long hold shelf periods and due dates um, because in some cases researchers are using material across the whole semester. Um, and then, uh, you know, this slide also notes kind of the, the rules we had to assign uh, for folks to use the circulation for staff to be able to check out material and manage requests. Um, and we also had to customize the uh, on hold shelf letter. Um, one of the benefits of this configuration is that when material is scanned in um, from the SCF or even if it's uh, picked from the shelf locally, uh, it generates a letter automatically to the requesting patron. Um, so now special collection staff don't have to do that part, um, manually sending emails uh, when the materials arrived, Alma lets them know automatically. So as Dulce talked about uh, testing, um, we did a lot of testing. Uh, we, you know, I, I hate to put it this way, but we kind of took advantage of the pandemic a little bit uh, because this was all work we could do at home, and a lot of us were at home for an extended period of time. Uh, we used the Alma Sandbox. We, uh, as Dulce said, involved WRLC. Um, what we tried to do in the testing is we tried to think of all the edge cases, all of the, the strange ways that people may request stuff. Um, you know, multiple users requesting the same item, patrons requesting an item that's already scanned in for transit, um, but still on site. Um, you know, two patrons working together, but only one of them is the requester. You know, all these things. Um, that we thought might happen infrequently that actually turned out to happen a lot. Actually, we don't have as many edge cases as we thought. We have a lot of strange cases. Um, and so we put together our documentation um, and we, uh, we are a heavy user of Slack. And so we pinned these, uh, these um, doc this documentation is pinned to our, the Slack channel that we use. So we have really easy ways for, for people to, to get to that information. Um, for staff training, we, we know that staff learn differently, uh, are comfortable with new procedures and new technologies at sort of different paces. So we tried to sort of meet people sort of where they were. We had a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings, but we also had full, uh, you know, sort of like, this is what's happening. Uh, we sort of peppered people during the whole tr testing phase with this is what's coming. Um, so, you know, it didn't catch anybody by surprise. We update our documentation on a regular basis. Um, as Dulce said, we had to make some adjustments to the terms of use and, and other things. And that was done as we were implementing it, as we were using it with patrons and we realized, you know, patrons were getting uh, notifications of like overdue notices. Uh-oh, 
you know, this is something we didn't anticipate. So let's let's fix that. Um, so I think that we are we are a group that enjoys troubleshooting. Um, and so somebody would post something in the Slack channel about, you know, I don't know what's happening with this record. And inevitably, like three people would be at the desk helping to solve it. Um, and I think we enjoy that, you know, thinking through your workflow and testing uh, their continued value in a new system is actually fun. So I think we actually enjoyed this process. Um, and it's rewarding, you know, we knew that what we were doing was beneficial for our work. Uh, we knew what we were doing was moving us forward and making our, our work better. And so that's very rewarding. Um, and we are really seen and sort of see ourselves, I think, as, as another fulfillment unit in the library in a way that we didn't before. Uh, we were sort of running our own show sort of on the side. We are now embedded with the, the fulfillment units um, in the library and, and talk the same language and pull the same statistics. So I think that we, we have very much enjoyed this piece of it. Definitely, John, it's really nice to hear you say that because I think it is, it has been fun. We talk now all the time about like how much we love Alma. When we hear people complain about it, we're like, nope, you haven't given it a chance. We love Alma. Um, so Dulce was giving you that overview of like sort of the architecture of Alma, but this is the sort of the visualization of what our workflow looks like now um, in terms of requesting and receiving boxes and books for patrons. Um, and I will say that like this has been a culture shift for us and our desk. Um, and the desk looks a little different, like the work that you do at the desk, there's a lot more scanning involved um, and um, a lot less time in a spreadsheet copying and pasting barcodes. So it's a trade off and this system is actually, it's better now because it does work for everybody in the same way. Um, you have to scan the boxes, you have to re re like receive the boxes back. Um, so the data is much more consistent. Um, so this is the visualization of our workflow. So for GW and consortium patron request, if it's a book, um, a patron can Consortium and GW patient, patron can request those directly through Primo. Um, and then that request is received either by the SCF or it appears on our pick from shelf uh, list or queue that we have in Alma that we monitor throughout the day. And so then we can page it on site or it gets delivered from WRLC. Um, for boxes, everybody for all box content, um, because we only have collection level records in Alma and Primo, that's intentional, or they're only just only a collection level is discoverable through Primo, the item records are suppressed, we have to and that that is intentional because it's we're just not set up to have patrons requesting boxes, specific boxes in Alma at this stage or in Primo. So we make all those requests for GW, all box requests for consortium and GW patrons, but we don't have to create new accounts for them. Um, for non-GW patron requests, box boxes and books, um, we create accounts for those patrons and they have a, a specific type of user type that um, aligns with our fulfillment rules. Um, so whether the patrons placing the request or whether we're making the request for them, um, these requests are received, they're either delivered or they're paged. Once the items are delivered to special collections, we scan it in and then the patron automatically receives an email that their materials are ready to view in the special collections reading room. So this, so many emails in the past, um, with Tammy and her team and the SCF are, are gone and it's amazing. There's very few now. I mean, we miss you, Tammy and the SCF folks on a daily basis, but I think it's better for all of us. And we really, really appreciate the patience that they have shown us during this process. Um, so we're on our last slide here. So what's better? Um, lots of things, everything. It's, it's, it's a culture shift um, for sure. And um, but the learning went really well. I think we adapted to this new change pretty quickly um, because we saw the benefits of it um, because some of the benefits are, right, fewer emails. We're not having to mediate every single request. There's consistent communication between the SCF and us and um, with our patrons. We have fewer mysteries that remain unsolved. Um, mysteries still happen, um, but now we are all able to read the item record and that history that is provided at the item level in um, Alma is extremely helpful. Um, we have much more complete and accurate use data in terms of 
specific collections. Now we know how many boxes did we request? How many boxes did we circulate? Um, and that's been wonderful to have that data for sure. Um, we have an improved improved understanding of the Alma architecture and the Primo user experience and having that special collections perspective in there has been really important. It helps see our work as part of the, we are part of the library. So it's been really great to see our work as part of the wider library ecosystem. Um, Jen is much more involved now as a stakeholder in the Alma meetings and the Alma stakeholder meetings. And um, that's, again, that's just been great to have that increased visibility and also that increased understanding um, in special collections of how Alma works. We're all very comfortable with Alma now for sure for many of the, the activities that we do with Alma. Um, and it's been a wonderful cross-functional collaboration with a number of different departments. Um, and so I think that is the end. Here are our contact, our emails. Please email us. We, will, we would share everything with you. We would love to talk with you more because there are like lots of other things that we couldn't cover in this talk, of course. Um, and we would be happy to share our documentation um, that we are always adding to. And I think at this time we can take questions if there, I'll leave the slide up here so you can get our email addresses, but um, I see that there's something in the chat. Are there questions in the chat um, or do folks, you can raise your hand and unmute and ask a question if you have any questions. We have some time left. I'll read the question in the chat. I already answered that question. Well, but you should read it. But yeah. people might not have heard it. Yes, go. This is how it is in the almost slack now. We're always like fighting to who's going to answer the question first because we're all so good at it. Um, so uh, the question was about we're all, I can't see it, sorry. We're all of the items in your special collections having records in Alma already when you started this project. Yes, all of the items were already, yep, yeah, like Jen said, books and boxes um, were already all in Alma. All the some of them were suppressed from Primo, but they were all there in Alma. Um, hi, Kat Bell. Kathleen Bell asks, "What does an analytics report look like that you all use frequently? Boxes, collections? Um, yeah. So you can, I, I, if you want to say more, but um, so we run, and I wish I had. We should have put some of those charts maybe on the slides like we had before, Jen. And I cut those slides. Um, we can run a number of reports um, about the. We, so we run reports on the type of user, the um, undergrad, grad, affiliated, you know, spec general user. Like so, that's like everybody um, that's not affiliated with WRLC or GW. And within GW, we can get grad and undergrad um, faculty staff, um, and then the number of boxes requested by those user groups, and then we can get the number of circulated items. So that would also capture like things that are circulated multiple times. Um, and we have really great data now on our collection use. We always have anecdotally said that the National Education Association archives were um, our heavily most heavily used collection. And they're still up there, but now we have the data say, well, actually it's the Corcoran collections that are, are getting the most use. And then, um, so that data is really, really fantastic. And I can see that having a lot of implications beyond just, you know, demonstrating our value and the type of use that we're getting, but also informing like digitization or grants, stuff like that. Any other questions? I'm gonna stop sharing. Yes, we would love to share some of those charts and spreadsheets with you, for sure. All right, well, if there aren't any other questions, we hope um, you will reach out to us if you want to learn more about how you can implement this at your institution. And I would encourage you that for all the special collections folks who are managing reading rooms, it is possible and it will make we your lives one. better. Oh, we do have a question. Um, so you don't use, oh, we do use archive yeah, space. We do use. Yes. Yes. What do you want to say, answer that, Jen, more fully? Well, so, you know, for, for our finding aids, 
for we have an instance of the public user interface for ASpace. So it's still our main tool for helping users find archival materials. Um, we just we can't can't circulate in it. So we use Alma for the circulation, um, but we still use we use ASpace for everything else. Okay, well, thank you again, everybody, and please do reach out if you want to talk more about this. Have a great day. Bye-bye.